Um, all right, so it is September 2018, and this is our live AEEG Q&A call. Um, so I always just like to start out with, are, are there any specific questions that you want me to dive into? Um, if you're having any, any challenges using AEEG in your, um, in your unit. Um, I know many of you have, have taken our online courses. Um, so we have our mastery course as well as some other cooling courses. So I know you guys know all about those. Um, so I just wanna make sure that we answer anything that is top of your mind first off. So you feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question or you can also chat it in. And um, what I've prepared for today is some basic trouble on using AEEG. So we'll go through through those and I have a an old monitor emulator that I found on my computer and we'll see if it's gonna run and I can um, walk through some troubleshooting on that older device as well. And so many of the principles will apply to doesn't matter what device you have or what um, tool you're using. So first off, any questions, any burning, burning questions? And of course, always unmute or ask questions or clarify or chat in if as we go along, things come to mind. So we usually um, just take about 20 minutes, um, 15 to 20 minutes on these calls, but I'm always open to staying on longer if there are more questions. I'll give you a minute if you have anything. Um, so if you don't know me, my name is Kathy Randall. Um, I have been teaching AEEG for a really long time now, 14 years, I think. Um, and so I travel and I teach and I do online courses um, and I absolutely love AEEG. Or you've never joined one of these before, I hope that you know just from the get-go that I am so passionate about AEEG. Because for me, it is the tool that we can use in the unit on a daily basis to help us get more information. So, so any questions going to pop up? I don't see anything in the chat yet. So I'll just dive in, but feel free to unmute or um, to jump in if you have anything you want to want to share. So for today, what I thought I would do is go through some troubleshooting tips. And so I made this little acronym. So if you've been to any of my classes, you know it's I'm all about the acronyms or easy ways for us to remember things. So troubleshooting, I want you to think of SAM, S-A-M. So S, the first thing that when we see a crazy AEEG, something is not looking right, you first off have to go to the sensors. You have to look at the placement of those. You wanna look at your impedance of those um, and go through all of those things together. So we will break it down into a little more detail, um, but this tends to be 90 plus percent of the problems are the sensors. So if you're using needle electrodes, many of these things don't even exist in your world. But if you're monitoring preemies, if you're using hydrogels because your unit has decided to get away from needles due to needle sticks or um, just to be a little less traumatic, although I think we could argue that sometimes the other sensors can be equally traumatic because we have to scrub the head. Um, but let's talk about some of the technical issues that arise. So first off, you need to be checking the sensors with cares. And in between, if issues come up. So for bedside nurses who are caring for babies with AEEG, you have to get them involved. They have to know why sensor distance is important and about keeping them symmetrical. So we know that if sensors are touching, we know that that can cause an issue with our signal. It can, it can completely dampen it and make it look like your baby has no, um, no strength in their brain at all. If they're close together on one side and wide apart on the other side, the tracing can appear asymmetrical. So this is why the 1020 system of electrode placement was developed, <clears throat> excuse me, because we wanted symmetry. We wanted symmetry not only in location, but symmetry in distance. And so the 1020 system really has to do with it really means they used to take, or they do still, take the head circumference and some other me measurements from front to back, and then they do 10% or 20%. So 10% is the smallest distance between standard electrodes. So 10% of head circumference, so if it's 40, then it's four. And then double distance is the 20%. So that would be 
you know, eight centimeters between two electrodes. So we have our short distance or our double distance. Those are the 10% or 20%. Um, that's where that comes from in the international system for the 1020 placement. But for us, we usually just use our little measuring tapes that come from, um, from different vendors. And, um, and with those, they come in two sizes, right? They come in the, the preemie size, which is two and a half centimeters. And they come in the large term baby um, size for measuring tapes um, of the um, three, um, three and a half. So it's two and a half and three and a half um, centimeters. So if you're using those measuring tapes, then you're getting consistency um, between, between patients. Many people ask me when should they use the little skinny one and when should they use the term one. I only use the small one for babies less than 30 weeks because I feel like the wider distance keeps us from having electrodes that touch. Um, and so I like to go with the, the wider distance even on, on smaller babies um, because I feel like it's, it gives us better, um, better readings. Um, so that's just my own personal thing. Um, some symmetry is important. So if you have, say, on the right side of the baby's head, let's say you have um, a laceration or maybe you have an IV or um, there's something that is impeding your ability to place those electrodes where you would want to and you need to either move those more anterior, more posterior, make them wider. I would always err on the side of wider, not narrower in your placement. And then I would just match up. So I always do the bad side first, whatever side I have to like make adjustments to, I do that side first. And then I mirror those electrodes on the other side. So um, that's, that's just kind of what I teach people to do because I feel like you get more consistency that way. Um, so oftentimes you'll see people place them, you know, in, in kind of an unusual spot to go around that, but then they put it in the typical spot on the opposite side. That's not gonna. That's not gonna help. You want to keep them as symmetrical um, as possible. Okay. So this is just an example um, of some really thin electrodes um, that we've used in some research studies. Um, and so we're just showing here just that symmetry, so that you can see here this distance between them, very symmetrical. The location on the head, very symmetrical. And then in this case, we just put the ground here on the forehead, but you know that the ground can can go anywhere. Um, so sensor position, very important when you start to see asymmetry in your patterns, um, you know, where one is really kind of flattened or more low voltage and the other one looks kind of normal and you're like, is this a stroke or, you know, something else going on? Always check the sensors um, first. Um, like I said, if you're using needles, some of these things are never going to really come up for you um, like this where we have this um, baby here who um, his electrodes were touching. And so you can see here on the left side what was happening. This AEEG pattern was very low voltage on this left side. The right side looked pretty good with a little bit of kind of attempt at some, you know, discontinuous patterns in here. But definitely this, this discrepancy between the left and the right. And then here you see all this noise. This particular device used to um, highlight where there was high impedance. And um, here you can see that there was high impedance and somebody was monkeying around with these electrodes. And then after that period, about 10 minutes, look what happened. The pattern goes very much back to a symmetrical pattern between the left and the right, a nice little discontinuous um, with alternations into continuous patterns. But Quite nice. So basically what happened here is they fixed the sensors. They were touching, it's causing this low voltage pattern. They fixed it and the baby went back to, it's a miracle, right? Back to this regular pattern. So this kind of transient asymmetry can oftentimes be um, from a malpositioned um, electrodes. The second thing that people need to troubleshoot is the impedance. So is the impedance value less than 10. So you can oftentimes have issues with your tracing when the electrodes are, are not well, um, well attached. This is especially important when you're using the standalone devices that don't have a very sophisticated amplifier or a head box where you plug the electrodes in. Impedance tends to be less of an issue as you're starting to use 
more of the full EEGs that have these really great amplifiers and filters on them. Um, but for a EEG standalone simple amplifiers, we need to have very clean signal to be able to get a good quality tracing. If you're using needles, this is not an issue, right? You go through the skin and your impedance is like practically zero. Um, if you're scrubbing the skin, then you're gonna wanna make sure that you're scrubbing it enough to keep your electrodes under five. And my personal preference is under, um, under 10 is, a, is minimum exceptions. I want it under five and the lower the better. But again, our babies have very fragile skin and you have to be careful that you're exfoliating but not excoriating the skin. So um, that, be, that can oftentimes be a, channel, a challenge. But keeping those electrodes low, um, the impedance low, but also remembering that that ground or reference electrode also needs to be um, low impedance as well. Sometimes we only focus on um, scrubbing the skin of the, the ones on the scalp, or if you're using needles, you're not scrubbing at all. And we forget that if you're using a hydrogel for the reference, that that also needs to be very low impedance. And sometimes you'll get a lot of noise in your signal because you've not taken, a, taken good care of that reference or ground electrode. So you still need to prep that skin. You still need to make sure that's applied to the baby, not to the linens. Sometimes I unwrap a baby and I find it attached to the, the sheets or to the blanket. Um, so you make sure that that, MP, that that reference electrode is always um, attached to the baby. So that's very, very important. Um, if you do um, use hydrogels, then I recommend that you hydrate them if their impedance gets over five. It helps to keep them um, with good conduction and um, that it can be very, very helpful. But overhydration can be an issue. Um, this is a picture of where we were hydrating them hourly for a research project and they were getting the hat wet. And so the hat and the hair was getting wet because they were overhydrating. And what was happening is that every hour when they did the hydration, it would basically, um, the water between the electrodes would cross over. And then it took an hour or so for that to dry out. And so you can see the pattern is going back up here to this kind of you know, discontinuous pattern. And then at the hour mark, it would drop down again and it would take like an hour for it to recover. And then it would drop down again. This was just over hydration and the hair was getting wet between the electrodes. Basically it was as if the, the um, electrodes were touching, even though physically they were separated. Um, so if you do this hydration technique, which is very helpful to keep your impedance low, it, will, um, it can have this risk. So you wanna watch out for that. Okay, so first off is sensors. So impedance, location, symmetry. So you wanna make sure that you're, you're keeping those three things in mind. The second thing you wanna look
Jan. Hi. So I'm curious when you have put an AEG on and it have a lot of cap and then a lot of scalp swelling and it's almost like a waterbed. If you're getting a reading, is everything okay? Because, you know, they kind of shift back and forth just if yeah. you turn the head, all of a sudden they moved over a centimeter and they're not matching up with the other side anymore. Yeah, no, it's a great, great question. So edema is such a crazy um, issue and it, and it really it doesn't really matter like what you're, if it's full EEG or if it's AEG, edema is number one, it's really hard to get good impedance. You will have, if, if you're not using needles and you're scrubbing and you're using hydrogels, it is crazy. Um, you know, you think, you think you've, you know, scrubbed enough, but it's the, the numbers are still high. So the impedance is oftentimes not only a reflection of the skin um, but also just in general, how much other things are impeding the signal. And so with edema, you will oftentimes see high impedance. Um, if they're moving around, um, it does make it challenging, especially if it's you're turning the baby to the left and it's a lot of dependent edema. Um, I see that a lot like on the ECMO cases where one side, it just looks completely dampened and then you might shift the baby a little bit and then that, that drops down, um, like the edema drops the other side, and now you have good impedance on the other. If it's moving like, you know, a less than a centimeter or a centimeter, it's, it's probably going to give you enough reflection. But I think it's a good thing to be at least aware of that there is this um, risk that what am I, you know, what am I really seeing um, there? So I don't know, does that answer, answer it for you? Yes, that answers it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. All right. So I'm re I just rebooted my other computer. <laughs> I don't know what the heck. <laughs> oh, it's so funny, computers, right? So we'll get the slides back. So do, where did I lose where did I lose my um slides so that I can know if I need to go back um and share anything? This will teach me to not always have it on my phone because that's usually what I do. I watch on my phone so that I can make sure. Um, do I need to back up? Or are we good? We can just keep moving. Moving forward. Anybody want to let me know where we, we kind of... Maybe. I was How long is okay. it? Maybe you can start from the beginning. Um, well, did you, did you... I was talking about artifacts, but were you not seeing my slides the whole time? Uh, yeah, well, I just joined it in 10 minutes later. Oh, well, you can grab the, re the, the recording. Let's see. I was okay. talking about, right. um, um, I was talking about the artifacts. Okay. So I'll just pull it back up, um, for the artifacts and that way we were, um, we're going and, that, and we have done like a full, um, presentation just on, on artifacts too. So that's, that's in the, um, archives, um, as well. So. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was muscle, especially when it comes to um, the um, needle electrodes, because I think that that's one of those things that, that oftentimes we do use the, the measuring tape that we're provided. And if we use the spots that we mark the skin, um, so I'll see if I can pull up my video so I can show you on my own, um, my own head here. Um, so sorry, this, I'm trying to like open my Zoom and, and so. so one of the things that happens I oftentimes think is people use those two dots as like their bullseye and they put the needle right in that location. And what happens is that the needle is, you know, usually about 10 millimeters long and they'll end up getting down into the, um, the muscle. And so they end up with a lot of muscle artifacts when they're using needle electrodes, instead of getting this really beautiful, clean um, tracing, they will oftentimes, you know, get a lot of muscle. So in order to avoid that, they need, what you need to train staff to do is to actually go a little bit above that dot as the insertion site, and then, and then put the needles in so that they, they go through that spot, not that they start at that I hope that's making making sense. Um, so that's like one of the most um, common um, artifacts that I see with needles that can be prevented. So if you identify it that fast and fuzzy, then um, then just you know look for the the actual sensor 
insertion and not that you would probably take them out unless it's very severe. Um, but just to be aware of that's likely what's going on and to help the staff. So next time they place, you can train them to just go a little bit higher um, and prevent that um, from happening. So, well, we may just have to talk it through because I don't know where, um, why my Zoom is not um, popping back up here. Let's see here, 801. Two, four, two, three, nine, nine. All right, let's see if I can just join it from the sideways way. Um, so the other area that I wanted that we've talked about in previous um, talks were, are the effects of medication on your AEEG. And to just always be aware of the fact that medications can very much impact our, um, our tracings and make them very complicated to um, you know, to interpret or can, you know, change the background pattern, especially if we're um, giving um, benzos or um, other kinds of sedation. Um, those are, are things that have oftentimes um, a huge effect on, on our AEEG. And then the, the third thing, or the fourth thing we're gonna talk about today is really the monitor settings themselves and making sure that you've created a standardized um, way of, of doing that, um, you know, setting up your devices in your unit so that there is consistency. Because I find that monitor settings tend to be the thing that will oftentimes um, cause you and your staff a lot of stress because, well, it doesn't look right. Um, I thought it was supposed to be looking this way. So hopefully I'll be able to pull up um, my screen again so that you will be able to, to see what I would like, what I would like to show you. Um, so we'll see if it's going to behave. Um, well, that file is opening, but this Zoom is really struggling <laughs> with my computer. I do not know why. Um, let's see if it will go. Thanks for bearing with me while I'm getting all of this back and working. Any other questions while we're um, while we're doing that. So hopefully it will all pop up here in a second. So any other questions? So, all right, looks like we might have success. Hoping, hoping. All right. Kathy? Can you hear me now? Someone was asking, sorry you guys for this technical issues. As you know, we don't usually have them. It usually works pretty good. Okay, I'm gonna pull up this. So are you able to hear me now? Can you give me a thumbs up, Dr. Teji? Yes, yes. All right. Perfect, thank you. All right. So I'm not sure who else was asking a quick question, but feel free. <clears throat> I've noted with the hydrogels, if they are very close to each other, I get a lot of artifacts like uh, low voltage yes. and uh, burst suppression uh, spikes. Ah, the burst suppression spikes. Hmm. I yeah. haven't seen that when it's so close together, but certainly I've seen the low voltage. And so what I was showing... So increase the distance and it uh, reverts back to, you know, yes. the band. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so we talked about sensors, sensor location. We talked a little bit about artifacts. 
Um, and then now in medications, which we've done previous before. And so what I wanted to do was talk a little bit around um, the, the settings, um, the monitor settings themselves, and, um, and be able to show you a little bit of, of that. So this is an old um, offline tool that we used to use, but I think it illustrates the points really well. Um, so this is just a basic discontinuous um, pattern here. And every device is going to have some differences in the screen displays. And so it's, it doesn't really matter what, what monitor you use. But some of the things I wanted you to be aware of are, are some of the controls. And so on some of the newer devices, um, you may see these um, you know, as filters or speeds or things like that. Um, but just know that the AEEG typically is always displayed at that six centimeters an hour or one centimeter, which is the distance between these gray lines is 10 minutes. So 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, 60 minutes, that's going to be an hour. And so that is, is always standard on our standalone devices. What you will find is if you're using a full EEG monitor is that everything is manipulatable or modifiable. And so what you will sometimes find is that the AEEG is not set to the right time scale. And it will look very patchy. It will almost look like um, uh, status epilepticus where it has that, those breaks and, and things. And so um, make sure that if you're using a full EEG that they have set the time scale to the six centimeters per hour so that it will be standard for you. But on our standalone devices, whether that's a Natus device or um, a Moberg device or, um, you know, a, a Menon device, all of those have standard displays for a EEG. You cannot make it eight hours in five minutes or, you know, or in five centimeters. You can't change it except on full EEGs. You can up above for every e AEEG, there is a corresponding a um, EEG, the raw EEG. And remember that every line on the AEEG represents. Oops. I'm going to mute. Oops. Sorry, my fault. Sorry, right. I'll just. Um, oh yeah, it looks like you joined twice. Um, so every line of AEEG is equivalent to 15 seconds of the AEEG, remember the max and the mins. And so when you're looking at the corresponding EEG, you can make some manipulations to this. And you can make a baby look like they have no brain waves, or you can make a baby look like they have seizures, depending on how you manipulate this. Most of us would start at plus or minus 50 as our scale. So plus or minus 50 microvolts as our scale for um, EEG but you can go smaller. So as I mentioned, you can make this look, you know, very bad um, if you put it all the way plus or minus 10, or you can go the other way and you can make a baby look very flat um, in their EEG. So make sure that you have a standard way of setting your displays. And I would say most of us would start at plus or minus 50. Um, this would be for any device um, that you have. So plus or minus 50 here. On full EEGs, they may call this the filter setting, um, and it may be something like um, eight, um, eight, usually is the one eight or 15 are the ones that, that we use um, for that. And I think the new OBM um, does that as well. It's eight or 15. The other piece of the EEG that you can uh, manipulate is the time scale. So it may be set at 10 seconds. So you can see here is a zero, and then there's minus five plus five. So it's set at 10 seconds. Some devices let you set this at 15 seconds and other devices let you set it at 30 seconds, a minute um, and more. If you're looking at preterm babies, it is sometimes helpful to look at one minute um, compressions because, they're, because they have such discontinuous patterns. It's difficult to see um, some of their, their spikes in their activity. So it's nice to keep it a little bit more compressed um, it also makes it a little bit faster to go through and to um, see, you know, to review areas if you have it at a one-minute scale. Um, 
this device also allowed you to compress it so much at 10 minutes, but um, I don't find that to be very helpful. I think that the 10 seconds um, is a little bit nicer. Um, and the one minute is helpful, like I said, for preemies. Um, but again, especially for looking at seizures, I find that one minute is also um, very helpful. I'm not sure if this baby um, had any seizures, but we can um, certainly look and see, but I don't see anything. Um, but it, it's when you're having seizures, it's sometimes easier to see the evolution um, of those seizures um, through there. So let me see if I can load another um, file really quick that I know has seizures um, and we'll see if it, um, I'll show you how that's helpful for that. So knowing that your, knowing what is your standards for your monitor settings is really important because it will help you to have that consistency from one person to the next, one patient to the next, um, and, and can be quite, um, quite handy, but it can be really challenging if you have people who are monkeying around with your, with your signals. So um, this is a patient who's having a seizure, and so I was gonna show you kind of what that looks like um, on the AEEG. So you can start to see it when, it when it's 10 seconds, right? You can see the spikes, they're starting. Um, but if you look at one minute, you can really see um, how even they are. And the other thing that you can really see is how it dies off um, when you're in the one minute compression. Um, so I'll just keep kind of going through. And you'll start to see how it gets very high, right? So we're, and then now it's starting to kind of, the frequency starting to separate a little. And then you'll see how it kind of dies off you'll see how it kind of goes to nothing. Um, same here, there's the seizure. It's very tightly compressed. Remember, this is a minute instead of our usual 10 seconds. Um, and you can see it happening and then going, up, separating and going away. Um, if we look at the 10 second, I'm going backwards through it. You know, there's, it's not as easy to see sometimes. I mean, it's definitely there. So, um, so just to show that, you know, you can change this, but if I was to play around with these, you know, you can make these seizures, you know, almost, and for really big kids, oftentimes I find that you almost need to go to 100 if they have really big seizures. So some of these seizures are quite large. Um, and 50, sometimes it can get lost. Um, so this is filling up the screen quite nicely. Um, but you can oftentimes manipulate during seizures um, to be sure that you're able to see, to see them. So we're gonna see if there's any other interesting things. Um, if you're into counting interburst intervals and you're not, um, you're not using a device that already does interburst intervals, also changing your time display can also be helpful. Um, when you start to have the baby's um, brain activity be a little um, further apart. So here you can see there's two bursts per minute here happening. It becomes a little easier to count the bursts. So there's two, there's maybe two and a half-ish. And you can uh, begin to um, see these a little bit easier, even if we look at the 10. You can now see here's the bursts and how far apart the bursts are. Um, but just to play with to play with these um, on your device and see if you can find um, some helpful displays, not to be afraid to play with it, but also to know it can be helpful in some situations to, to find these and you know, these to fine tune the displays, but also um, that if someone else has played with them and things look really funny, it's, um, it can also be, make your AEG very challenging. So I just wanted to, um, to show you some of these um, you know, ways that we can use the device and, um, to, and to not be afraid to play with them, but how important it is to know, you know, what are your standards um, in your unit. So um, let's see if there's anything else interesting. This is a very long tracing, like 70 hours or something. Let's see. So any questions about display stuff um, or anything like that? You can see, look how sparse the burst suppression is on this one. 
Any questions about that? So sorry about the um, technical issue. I don't know what happened. So let me, I'm gonna stop sharing that and go back to the PowerPoint here for a sec. So any questions around, around that? So we talked about sensors. We talked about the distance, some of the issues with edema. We talked about if, you're, if you use hydrogels and hydrate, some of the complications that can happen there. Um, then we talked a little bit about some of the common artifacts, muscle artifact, heart rate artifacts. Um, and then I talked in, in a previous, I think last month, we talked about medications. Um, so I didn't go too much into that. And then the monitor settings. So these are the things, the four things that no matter what, if you have issues with your AEG, it's just not quite lining up to what you would expect for that baby. Um, it's not giving you the information that you were hoping for. These are the things that I would look at um, in kind of sequential order. Sensors, so remember Sam, sensors, artifacts, meds, and your monitor. And those would be the, the four things that I, would, that I would troubleshoot. So anyways, thanks for bearing with me. I'm so sorry about all those technical um, glitches that we had, but um, any, any final wrap up questions for this month? Um, as always, we'll be back on um, the end of the month. I think it's actually a little bit earlier um, Oh, here, I wanted to show you these too. One, one quick sec. I forgot that I threw in those screenshots. Um, oh, I'm excited to see you in Boston too. I know, I can't believe it's next week. Um, that'll be fun. Um, some of you may have a device that has this monitor scale. I forgot that I threw these in here in case the other thing didn't work. Um, there's a, there is a um, setting that you can set used to be on the old CFM, now it's available on the Olympic um, OBM. It's called gray scale. So you can turn this on or turn this off. Um, so for some of you, you may have, um, may have this ability. I like to, to um, describe them as the difference in the tracing is using a Sharpie marker or using a pencil. So if you had a pencil that was laying on the side of the paper and it was just as the needle is literally going up and down on the side, remember the old AEG used to be pen on paper. So this is trying to emulate that old um, device. Where the, the shading is heavier, when you have your monitor on grayscale, if it's available on your device, you will see that there are areas where there's more concentration of color. That means there's more concentration of brain activity in these areas. If you're still interpreting the AEEG, you still use the upper margins and lower margins. It's just a way to get a little bit more granular with the actual, like what percentage of time is the baby spending in these areas. So wherever there's heavier shading, just think of it as the pencil, spent, the pencil was spending more time there. So it's just darker because it's actually a heavier um, marking versus this kind of traditional display that many of us are used to, think of that as just like a Sharpie marker where the Sharpie marker were just going up and down and up and down and there's really no, um, gradu you know, like no graduation of that. It's just kind of all or nothing um, there. So anyways, grayscale, some people love it, some people hate it, some people are purists and they just like the old original signals. Um, but just know that if your device looks different and it has this kind of shading, um, you very well may have a device that has that option turned on. Um, so like I said, some people love it, some people hate it, um, and it's really kind of a personal preference. So um, it is something that, that does exist. So I wanted to make sure that I, that I at least sh showed you um, that. Some of you have some seizure detection algorithms, and so you may have highlights on your device. Um, and some of you have uh, the ability to do um, some of the other things like um, automated background classification. So you may see that here as well. What type um, of so. monitor, Kathy, has these type of uh, options? Which ones? The one you have it right now, uh, low voltage. Yep. It sort of calculates for you. Yeah, yeah. So there are two devices that I know of. One is the Olympic um, Brains device. 
the OBM. It has this as a autom it's called the automated background classification. Um, and then there's another device um, that's available in, I don't think it's yet in the US, but it's in Europe as well as uh, mm -hmm. South America called the NeuroSoft. And okay. it also does this calculation. Can we get a tabulated uh, log of this type of information that we can uh, note that there were so many of these low voltage, there were so many of these burst suppression and which are linked to the actual area on the AEEG? Yeah, so on the OBM, it, when, it changes, um, when it changes from one pattern to the next on the automated, I believe it creates a marker in your mm -hmm. device the mm -hmm. NeuroSoft device actually calculates percentage of total trace as um, percentage, you know, like say 20% was burst suppression, 30% was continuous low voltage, and the rest 50% was discontinuous. So the NeuroSoft in real time does percentage calculations of background. Um, the OBM, I believe, is only just um, the notation of the background itself, and I don't think it gives like a tab at like a table of like how many minutes it spent before it converted, but I believe you can export the report. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, it's uh, what slide, uh, the slide you showed previously with the grayscale, which is very informational. Uh, this type of thing uh, to calculate the uh, lower border and upper border mm -hmm. is subjective. Unless, yes. I mean, with the technology available, you should be able to get a number what mm -hmm. is the average, uh, you know, uh, lower border yeah. at, at this time? Yeah. And in a span of 24 hours, if we have this, it would be very beneficial in a busy unit to have these numbers and yeah. then you can verify them as you go, uh, you know, read them. Yeah, yeah. And of course, in the ones I've seen outside of the U.S., it does give you a percentage, but sometimes there are artifacts that are causing maybe a more discontinuous looking pattern, but the baby's real pattern is, you know, really lower than that. So it still requires us to go back and validate, but certainly it gives you a nice, um, especially if the transitions are short between them, it is really nice to be able to see the percentage of time that sure. babies are spending mm -hmm. um, in that. And I'm sure that as um, these features become more popular and used, I'm sure that with feedback that the, that more devices will include these. Um, I know it took, um, almost eight years to get FDA approval for just what this is, just this little simple, wow. just pattern. Um, because of, you know, because of interpretation, they still want it to be a clinician's job to interpret, um, but the FDA was able to allow for this. And this is, if you have an OBM device and you have this, um, it's only on the cross cerebral channel because that was the original, um, you know, Lena Hellstrom Westis and all of that was always published off the P3, P4 data. Um, so they only approve for the background classification to be applied to the P3, P4 um, channel. So if you have it installed on your device, you do have to switch around to find it. Um, and again, I, I haven't used it a lot, but I've, I've seen it on some devices um, and I believe it just has it in a table that it basically gives you an automated event when it changes. But you're, I'm sure your local reps can, can help you. I don't, I'm not sure who everybody is anymore, but I'm sure they'd be happy to, to share what they have. And I'm sure if there's any improvements, maybe we'll see more in the future too. Um, but certainly I think it's something that will make life easier. It does make life easier um, because you're able to see at least these really significant changes from one to the other. Great question. So our next call will be October 22nd. Hopefully we will be completely tech issue free, but I always appreciate you guys hanging in with me and, um, and for jo joining me and spending some time. And I'm always happy to answer your question. Kathy, I have a question. I missed yeah. what you mentioned about the edema. Ah, mm -hmm. Yeah, so edema always causes um, issues with impedance. And so the impedance is always going to um, read high, even if you've scrubbed the head well, or even if you're using needles, it's just the impedance um, to that, uh, to the signal. So with edema, um, if it, what Anne's question was, you know, what if it causes um, 
the when you turn the baby's head, it causes the electrodes to squish together more on one side than the other. Um, what I find happens is that it's more that the fluid is impeding and not the distance doesn't quite seem to matter quite as much. Um, but it will oftentimes show a very low tracing, a low voltage pattern, only because the the fluid is dampening the signal. And if you have this roving edema, left side, you know, it's, you know, high, um, you know, if all the edema goes to the right side, you'll oftentimes see that the, the tracing gets very dampened, but the left side might look okay. And then you turn the baby to the other side and the, you know, the um, electrodes get pulled away because of the edema on the left side now and the right side looks pretty good. So you oftentimes have this kind of roving um, asymmetry based on baby position. Um, there's really nothing we can do about it. It's if there's something critical going on, um, that's where it's an advantage to get a full EEG, where you can have your electrodes be placed in multiple areas and be able to avoid avoid that. But the full EEG over those edematous areas will be equally dampened, but they just have the advantage of having other electrodes in other areas, and they can, you know, reference what's happening um, that way. There's there's really nothing we can do about it. And I think the thing you have to do at the bedside is just decide, you know, am I getting anything that's valuable and is it worth it leaving it on right now? Maybe I just take it off and wait until some of the edema um, resolves. Um, but I've seen people move them more anterior. So if all that cap it and everything is in the back, um, you can move your electrodes more anterior, so more towards that frontal, frontal central area, but just be aware that you're really just trending activity at that point. We don't really have norms for those areas, but you could cer certainly look for seizures that are happening um, and maybe avoid some of those areas, um, but making an interpretation of the background pattern, we don't know the norms over those other areas, so I would just use it as a trend. Um, not, and I wouldn't use the classic um, thresholds for normals um, over those areas. Does that help? All right, everyone. Well, hopefully um, I will see you all next month. Again, thanks for bearing with all the technical stuff. Appreciate you um, always being so patient and um, we'll see you next month. And if, and as always, email if you have any questions or um, need anything in the meantime. Um, just love having you all here with us. Uh, let's see what my, all right. Well, I will um, ring off and see you guys next time. Thank you, everyone.